I'm really excited about 10 days prayer that is coming up and with Jonathan Frizz and our friends from 120 cities from around the world. And these are unusual times. This pandemic has literally uh, covered the whole earth. But you know what I'm excited about is I believe there is a move of God that is coming. I believe we're on the leading edge of that move and our prayers are strategic. Now there's something very specific that I would like you to pray over and it's a point of repentance for us. Because some 1800 years ago, the church allowed the one commandment Jesus owned as my commandment to slip off the table. I believe we must get it back. Historic moves of God have been uh, cut short because of our failure to obey that commandment. It was his commandment, love one another as I have loved you. He gave it the same night he announced the new covenant. He gave us a new commandment. That is so significant and we must in this season embrace that commandment as his church. You know, you have to go back to history to see the significance of this uh, in some amazing ways. First of all, we have to go back, let's say, to the time when God gave the Ten Commandments. Remember the children of Israel, led by Moses, were at the foot of Mount Sinai, and they were there as Moses went up into the mountain, and God began to speak to Moses, and he wrote on those tablets the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments are so incredibly significant as we were to, were to look at them. But the people, when they saw the thunder and the lightning and they heard the trumpet and the, saw the mountain filled with smoke, they trembled in fear and they stayed at a distance, the scripture says, and, and they said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. It was 40 years later that Moses reminded them of this and of what God had said. Here's what God had said. What the people say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like me from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I'll call him to account. Then he summarizes it this way, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him. Listen to that phrase, you must listen to him. This was 1300 years before Jesus was born, but we had some amazing preparation for an incredible change that was going to come. For example, when David, on about the year 1000 BC, David begins to sing a new song. He says in Psalm 33, sing to the Lord joyfully, sing to him a new song. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the peoples of the world revere him. This shift in a new song that David, it was just not that he was writing another song. It was a whole new theme that was being introduced. He continues this in Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, the goyim, his marvelous deeds among all people. This is because when God had given his promise to Abraham, his covenant with Abraham, he had said all nations of the earth are gonna be blessed. It went beyond just the family of Israel. It was bigger than that. But Israel's prophets began to speak. 300 years after David, about 700 BC, it was Isaiah the prophet who picks up this theme in Isaiah chapter 42. See, former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Listen to what he says. Sing to the Lord a new song his praise to the ends of the earth. In fact, Isaiah goes on to say in the 43rd chapter, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now, the interesting thing is about the use of the word thing. When we use it, many times we're being a little bit 
uh, unclear. You know, if I were to say to someone, uh, go get me that thing in the other room, what happens is um, the person might say, what thing? What are you wanting? And that's a logical thing. See, I'm doing a new thing. We could say, what thing? It would be a hundred years later when we would know clearly what that new thing was. It's when Jeremiah the prophet began to speak and the Lord speaks through him and says this in Jeremiah 31, 31. A time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them out by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. He goes on to say, this is the covenant I'm going to make. After that time, declares the Lord, I'm going to put my law in their hearts. I'm going to write it on their, uh, I'm going to write it, put it in their minds. I'm going to write it on their hearts. Uh, no longer will a man teach his neighbor, say, know the Lord. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Ezekiel, who was a contemporary uh, to Isaiah, he begins to speak in Ezekiel 36, 26, and he says this, I will give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. I'm going to remove from you the heart of stone. I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Now, of course, we know that it was some 600 years later that John the Baptist uh, began to prepare the way for the Lord. People began to ask him, are you that prophet that is supposed to come? Because they remembered the word that God had given through Moses. He said, I'm not that prophet. But he begins to say, there's one coming after me and I'm preparing the way for him. And it was in that season that John the Baptist saw Jesus and he said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And this is an amazing season because he says, I've seen and I testify that this is the Son of God. Do you remember the time that as Jesus had called his 12 disciples to himself? There was a time he took three of them, Peter, James, and John. He went up into the mountain uh, to pray. And it was there that Jesus was transfigured. They saw him as they had never seen him before. It says his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as light. And just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Now it was Peter who seldom was at a loss for words who said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you want, I'm going to build three shelters. I'm going to build one for Moses, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was still speaking, you remember this bright cloud envelops and, and a voice out of the cloud speaks and says, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Now we've heard those words. Because they are the words that God spoke to Moses 1,300 years earlier. Listen to him. You must listen to him. And at that point, the disciples, of course, Peter, James, and John, fell on the ground. And uh, Jesus came over, touched them, and said, it's okay for you guys to get up. And when they got up, they saw Jesus alone standing there. Moses represented the law. Elijah represented the prophets. But now the one they had proclaimed, Yeshua HaMashiach, had come and he was there. Now let's go to the Passover. This was after three years of ministry in which Jesus, just his amazing work had taken place. And uh, it's this final Passover. We call it the Last Supper. And Jesus, as he had gathered disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he takes the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. You know what's so amazing about this? On the same night, the final night before Jesus went to the cross, he introduces the new covenant promised by Jeremiah and a new commandment. These two were to be inextricably linked together throughout church history. 
Tragically, they got separated from one another. Jesus, that night that he announces the new covenant, now gives a new commandment to go with it. John 13, 34 records that. A new command I give you, love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You have to love one another as I have loved you. This is the mark of us as believers. It what separates us from others. Our love for one another, the new covenant, which is announced in his blood, comes with a new commandment. This commandment summarizes all that he desires for us. Now, if you're like me, when I first saw this 30 some years into ministry, I don't know how I had missed it, but I missed seeing this commandment. I was confused because I remembered a time that an expert in the law, the law of Moses had come up to Jesus and said, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Notice the words, in the law. You see, Jesus was born under the law. This man was an expert in the law. And he comes to Jesus with this question, the greatest commandment in the, law, in the law. Jesus responds by giving the Shema from Deuteronomy chapter six. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Homoios in the Greek, we get the word homogenized, which means inseparable from it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now, Jesus did not come to reinforce the law. He came to fulfill it. He certainly didn't come to abolish it. He was going to take it to another level that really expressed what his father truly desired. So this answer, uh, Jesus said at one time, we don't have any record of him repeating that again, and he did not turn to his disciples and say, this is my commandment. I want you to make it a core tenet of Christian faith. Uh, the gospel writers, none of them record this dual commandment in the way he gave it. I really believe that we, uh, some couple hundred years into Christianity, for some reason we went back to uh, Jesus' answer about the law and substituted that for the actual commandment that Jesus gave us. His command was this. He owns it in John chapter uh, 15, verse 12. He said, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. John 15, 17, again, this is my command, love each other. I think it's so important for us to recognize how significant this is. John, in 1 John 4.10 says this, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. What God is desiring in this season is for us to receive the love of heaven poured out by the Holy Spirit to allow that love to flow out through us to people that are all around us. It starts with our love for one another as the body of Christ. Then it goes to our neighbors who surround us, people uh, who have all kinds of different uh, faiths or beliefs or absence of belief. And then it goes even to those who consider themselves our enemies. We are a unique people called to love the people that are around us. The difference between this and the Shema is that the Shema was based on our finite ability to love God with our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. This commandment is based on God's infinite ability to love us and to pour his love into us by the Holy Spirit so we have the capacity to love as we could never love before. Romans chapter five, verse five says this, hope does not disappoint because God 
has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given to us. This is an amazing opportunity for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit and allow that love to flow out of us like a river. The Apostle Paul, who was so uh, well educated in the law, when he wrote his Romans letter in Romans 13, 8, he says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love, love is the fulfillment of the law. In his Galatians letter, Galatians 5.13 he says, brothers, you're called to freedom, but don't use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. When we love one another in the body of Christ, we are expressing our love to God who now by the Holy Spirit lives in that brother or that sister that surrounds you. When we treat each other carelessly or with apathy or we actually do harmful things, which has happened so many times in history, we are doing that to our Lord Jesus Christ who lives in them. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 10 says this, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. Love for God has always been expressed in our obedience to him. 2 John chapter 1, verse 6 says this, This is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, and as you've heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. My prayer is that in these 10 days, we will repent of having abandoned Jesus' commandment, the only command he said is my commandment, the one given the night he gave the new covenant, a new commandment, the mark of discipleship. Let's repent for having lost that and abandon it. And let's pray that God will bring new covenant and new commandment back together in this coming revival. God bless you.